Welcome back to the Goldmark Gallery and to another impromptu exhibition. Today we have a show of nearly 200 pots, I think, here by Nick Collins. The last time we showed Nick's work was back in 2020, I think. So there'll be pots here that you might not have seen for a while. Uh, hopefully some fresh new faces too. Most of you will be aware of Nick's work. He is a wood firing potter uh, who's working down in Devon at the moment. Fires work in an Amagama kiln and you'll probably be quite familiar with the, the kinds of effects that we're going to see on his pots. We've covered his work a lot here at the gallery. I'd like to start today though with a little memory of when I first met Nick. Nick won't remember this at all. I think our first show of Nick's pots was back in 2011 and at the time I was in my last years of school I think and I remember meeting Nick for the first time. He'd come to stay with us for the duration of the exhibition. I remember driving over with my mum worrying about what kind of beer can we get and me not being able to help her very much with that. I remember seeing him for the first time in our kitchen. It's a lovely, softly spoken guy who looked like a Viking. He had a great big beard. He was wearing a huge woolen knitted jumper that almost looked like a chainmail shirt. And I remember how, how quiet and quite reserved he was, how interestingly he talked about his work that first time I met him. And those two different sides of Nick are kind of captured, I think, in his work, the sides of Nick who, was, as a young man, worked as a welder making silos and who now today uh, fabricates his own machines to help in his workshop on the one hand. And then the quiet and, and reserved and, and uh, carefully thinking Nick. You can see it in his pots, the breadth of his pots, the range that can span from very beautiful, quite refined, elegant little bowls that have been thrown off the hump like these. Some of the very clean lines in pots like this beautiful Bellamine bottle behind me. It's beautifully simple form with this lovely line from base to belly and neck. And then on the other side, the kind of vigour, the, uh, the bravado of some of these larger works, works that are encrusted in thick texture, uh, that have asymmetrical shapes to them, forms to them, pots that are so gnarly that they've even got uh, firing cones stuck in the side of them. That captures, I think, the, the double essence of Nick's work, which we'll see in this show. Pots that span that divide, that breadth from the very elegant and refined and carefully thought and considered through to the, the supremely vigorous and free and kind of liberating work that he makes in his Anagama kiln. I think the different kinds of pots that you can see just on these two shelves in front of me really show off that range that I was still talking about. Uh, from the very sort of clean lines of some of these Bellamine bottles to the much more rugged appearance of, um, say, these bottles or some of these jars. Nick fires his work to high temperatures in a highly complex reductive atmosphere in his Anagama kiln. Now, there's a myth that has persisted in the kind of work that he produces, the kind of firing that he works with and which other potters around the country and in places like America and Japan uh, work in too, that if you simply pack the kiln full with, with pots, if you choke it with enough wood, a reductive enough atmosphere, fire it for long enough, that the kiln will do all the work for you. That the beautiful effects on uh, many of these pots, the, the dribbles of ash, the beautiful blushes of colour, are simply the accidents of the kiln. That couldn't be further from the truth of how Nick works with his kiln, the relationship that he's built with it over many years. It doesn't marry with his own description of uh, what it's like trying to work with the flame, trying to work with the atmosphere in the kiln. He's described it in terms as a relationship with another human being. It's often a battle, a fight, a conversation, a dialogue. 
there are times when it gives and times when it takes away. In fact, he once described it to Mike Goldmark as a little bit like gold digging. You can have as much of the knowledge as you need. You can have as much of the experience as you need. You can have very carefully thought through, planned what you're going to do. You can have intensely uh, accurate understanding of the place you're going to visit, uh, whether there might be gold there, uh, you've studied the, the materials you'll be working with, but it's not until you've got your hands dirty, until you've got your hands uh, in the earth itself, and you've found that nugget that you really know whether you're going to get something out of it or not. Wood firing is a little bit like that. Nick has been working with this kiln uh, and with wood firing kilns now for many, many years. It's over 10 years ago that we first showed him, and at that point he was already an advanced, experienced wood fire. He knows the kind of capricious behaviour of a wood firing kiln. He knows at any given time how the atmosphere is developing in the kiln. He knows how crucial it can be in the last five minutes of a firing, how that firing is finished, may dictate the total essence of what's inside it. It's also often described as a very inefficient way of working and of firing, certainly compared to a more standard production method of working with a, a large industrial kiln or with gas or with electric. But actually, when you think about it, there is a real efficiency to wood firing as an art. It's taking two of the most fundamental and abundant materials, clay and wood, and with the addition of fire, it can create things, surfaces, qualities, colours of the kind you cannot find anywhere else in the world outside of the realms of geological time, the kinds of colours we see in deep sediment, in magma, or in the weathering of time, in sands whipping around, in gnarled roots, in the weathering of, uh, of uh, frost and rain on man-built uh, buildings, on metal, on mountainsides and cliffs. The extraordinary simplicity, really, at root of the way that Nick and other wood firers work, yet still produces things, qualities, uh, surfaces, which we don't see anywhere else. Just looking at some of the beautiful ash uh, surfaces and some of these uh, large medieval jugs here and the complexity in them, the kind of breadth of colours, the breadth of textures, is extraordinary. And often I think the difficulty in wood firing work is it operates on a kind of gut instinct feeling level. And it's often very difficult to put that into words. It's why we often see in countries like Japan, where there's been a very uh, long-standing tradition of wood firing, people describing the colours and the qualities of surfaces with reference to the natural world, to the beautiful, dark, mottled browns of stewed tea leaves, or the, the dark greens of moss, or maybe uh, the cool green of a glaze, like the cool mist that falls over water on a cold early morning. In our own language, we often lack a simple way of describing these kinds of surfaces. But there is something that gets to us at a fundamental level. There is an instinctive reception that we have from wood firing work. And putting that intangible quality into words can be very difficult. I would find it hard, for example, to put into words the kind of feeling that emanates from a pot like this, exactly how it makes me feel as I'm walking around it, observing the surface, beginning to get an understanding of where it was in the kiln and its story, its path, the experience that brought it from raw clay to the form it has now. It's a beautiful, large piece, but it has a kind of very quiet, refined, gentle manner to it. It's also an example of how Nick has to think very carefully about the way he's building up forms like this and how they're going to work with the flame and the ash. You'll see that this is a pot that's been made up of a sort of series of straight lines here. There's not a, there's not a single curve to it. What that does is each of these kind of 
breaks within the, the form, these sort of shoulders, helps deflect the fire around it, deflect the ash around it, and give a much more interesting and varied surface. Some of my very favourite pots in the exhibition are in this corner here, in particular this extraordinary jug. Now I don't actually know exactly what conditions were required within the kiln for it to have gained this beautiful sort of sugary crystalline frosted surface here. The whole surface of this jug absolutely glitters. It's affected uh, both this, I think the cellars and glaze up here and the chino underneath it and this ash that's gathered on it too. This is really what the joy of wood firing is all about and the particular way that Nick wood fires. A pot like this ceases to be a simple functional tool, a necessary part of your kitchen. There's a whole landscape in here, not just a story of the firing, but a world of, of colours and surfaces and textures to understand, to return to time and time again. There are pots here which you would never tire of, which you can find fresh things to see, fresh ways of seeing, every time you were to pick them up, use them and set them back in your home. To those two basic materials of clay and wood, we could also add a third in this exhibition, and that's the many scallop and seashells that you'll see uh, dotted on these pots. These have been used as sort of wadding to help uh, bolster the pots up for them to sit on in the kiln so that they don't fuse to others or fuse to the base of the kiln or kiln shelves themselves. A quick overview of the chemistry of these shells. They're made of calcium carbonate and when they get to very hot temperatures that turns to calcium oxide. Now, normally that would have a very high melting point, way beyond what you could achieve in a kiln. But when that calcium oxide uh, combines with the alumina and the silica that we find in the clay and in the fly ash, that melting point is, is lowered right down to uh, around 1170 degrees Celsius, so well within the range of what Nick fires to. All that science means is that at the contact point on these shells, particularly around the edges, where the interface between the clay and the shell is, is where we get a beautiful fusing, a uh, beautiful range of colours. It's also common because the shells have uh, salt in them, the salt can volatilise and we get all kinds of beautiful colours around a shell. So often it's these points of contact where we get all kinds of interesting textures and colours going on. But the other thing that's really beautiful about these shells, and in particular I think on this tall bottle here, um, with this lovely iron rich glaze that it's got on it, is that they're a kind of metaphor. The way that these pots are precariously balanced on them, the way that they're very gently placed before the firing starts, that sense of anticipation of uh, the fragility of this way of working, um, the unknown aspect of what's going to happen in the firing, no matter the amount of experience and knowledge and understanding that a potter like Nick has, is all captured in these scars that are left behind. These pots are not just the results of a successful firing, they're the survivors of an intense and volatile atmosphere. When I'm walking around a show like this, I'm often thinking about the sheer craziness of what Nick and other wood firing potters like him does. This kind of way of working is the ultimate in variables really. There's so many open aspects of the process that can change it at a moment's notice. Whether the wood you're using is, uh, is dry, whether it's green, whether it's damp, what kind of wood it is, whether the earth itself is damp, whether it's a, a wet day, a dry day, a stormy day, there are so many things that can affect that four day process, that four day firing and that at any one point could change the whole direction of where that firing has gone. There's also the craziness of how Nick operates during that firing. You see scenes of him uh, trying to right pots that have fallen over. Wood that's pushed through the stoking holes can sometimes bounce around and knock pots over or uh, smash things. Pots fall over and they fuse together. 
And then you see Nick unpacking a kiln and having to take a hammer to beautiful uh, vases and bottles that have fused with each other in great lumps of sort of, uh, of pottery, uh, four or five stuck together at a time. And you see sites like that and you have to think what kind of commitment does that require of a person? You try and imagine what it must be like to be someone like Nick who year in, year out has had to face that kind of, um, that kind of difficulty, that kind of struggle over and over and over again with no real assurance of success or failure. It must completely redefine what those words mean for you. As any potter knows, unbricking, unpacking the kiln can be a difficult process at the best of times. Imagine what a, an anxiety-inducing, what a stress-inducing experience it must be for Nick to open that kiln and to see what he often does, the number of pots that have fused together, trying to work out in his head how he's going to deal with what's coming out of it. I can't think of any other kind of art form that demands that of a maker, who demands that amount of preparatory work, the kind of throwing, the preparing of glazes, the stacking uh, and, and, and buying of, of wood, um, all of that material brought together, and then that final finishing process being a, a, chance, a, a chance experience, a chance uh, a moment whether we're going to get anything out of it or not. I can't imagine any other art form that really has that kind of risk built into it. All that means that for Nick, it takes an awful lot of time to be able to come to terms with how a firing has gone and the work that comes out of it. It's a process of nearly two or three weeks of slowly removing the work, coming to terms with what he's seeing, uh, acclimatising to the results, realising the pots that he might have to destroy in order to save others, and how much more special that makes those that survive the process. It's a long period of finding the diamonds among the rough. And it also means, I think, that we ought to spend the same kind of time getting to know Nick's work, getting to understand the complexity of the surfaces, the colours, the textures that are going on, of really exploring that first gut instinct when we see some of his pots and letting our own uh, feelings about it sort of develop over that time as he does when they first come out of the kiln. It's interesting, wood firing work is not something that most people are born with. Most people don't grow up in families, even in Japan, in households where work like the pots you've seen in this exhibition are out on display. It's work that most of us are introduced to at some point and have to come to terms with. We have to explore some of those feelings that we have for the work. It's certainly not a kind of pottery that's for everyone. But the joy of ceramics is that it's a broad church. It's not just a broad church, it's probably the oldest church. It's an art form that dates back to our very first uh, experiences as humans making things that have some kind of decorative expression. I think there are some absolutely choice pots in this exhibition. The pot department have done a beautiful job of uh, gathering these pieces together and putting on this show. I think it's nice that we end with this beautiful Bellamine bottle that really captures everything about Nick's work. You've got the multiple faces that you get in the wood firing work, this beautiful blush of colour from the ash, the side that's been sheltered uh, from all that ash, flame and heat. I hope you've enjoyed seeing some of these pots. It's work that's very difficult to describe. Um, it's difficult to describe your reaction to it, your, uh, your emotional uh, reaction to seeing some of these pots. And really they're best served by the beautiful work of Johnny behind the camera showing you some of the beautiful details, the, the wonderful uh, colours and textures going on in them. There's plenty here to explore. Come and visit us at the gallery and see them for yourselves. We'll take a look at the website and see if there's something that might take your fancy. I hope you've enjoyed and we'll see you again soon.